Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I'm Barry Rowland. In this episode, we will be finishing the two-part video review series on the Pro Series Sim Cockpit from the guys at All-in-One Gaming. This is the setup video. Be sure to check out the build video for detailed information about how the Pro Series is made and constructed. In this video, we will be mounting a direct drive servo, a pedal set, shifter, and of course, a seat. Then taking the Lotus 79 to Sebring, where we can put some proper pressure on this cockpit to reveal any flex and other good or bad characteristics. Time to put it through the SRG's review process and see how it does. So, let's get to it. Now I'm going to get the motor mounted that I'll be using for testing on this cockpit. This is a Midge 20, also known as the Model 130 ST. Its bolt pattern for its flange is the same thing as the Semi-Cube 2, so those will fit. The Semi-Cube 2 Ultimate, I believe, is a little bit different pattern. It's closer to what a Cole Morgan servo pattern is, but that will fit because my Cole Morgan will fit also. Just about anything I looked at would fit as far as it you know, being a servo motor type of direct drive wheelbase system, uh, except for the Fanatex and they have their own system. This will also fit, and this is a, and which is kind of surprising me. I just got this in while I was doing this review. This is the Alpha Mini from SimMagic. It's a new wheel they've come out with, 10 newton meter. It's got a 92 millimeter spacing, and this just barely makes it in the slots that are cut on this front motor mount. So I was a little surprised by that, that it actually made it in. But I'll be using something else with that, and I'll be using it when I actually do the review. I'm going to be using this because this has 20 newton meters, and I want to put some force on the front mount bracket system and also the wheelbase uprights on this Pro Series cockpit from All-in-One Gaming, just to see how it responds. 20 newton meters is pretty good. If you got that at full force, I don't know if, you, if you've ever had that in your hands, but yeah, it's a handful of 20 newton meters. You know, you can go higher, obviously, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a handful. So I think it's going to do the job. I've got my M8 bolts I'll be using to bolt these together. Now, these might end up being just a little short, but I'm thinking they're, they're just going to make it. I'm going to use some nylock nuts anyway on the end, so I have to have enough thread on the end here to engage the nylock part so it won't vibrate or rattle loose. So, yeah, that's how much room I have got. I think I can make it. We'll see once we get over there. If not, then I'll just get a longer bolt. <laughs> Very simple. So what we'll do now is go ahead and get this bolted up. When we come back, we'll go take a look and see how it went. So I have the Midge 20 now mounted, and everything went quite smoothly. You can see it's fitting in the slots there. Towards the upper of the slots, we can look down lower. You can see there's more slot left down in there. But yeah, this is pretty sturdy. It's just like the rest of the cockpits that I think I've reviewed when it comes to profile cockpits. The wing configuration with dual corner brackets bolted down. Yeah, this is, is very tight. I, I can take my hand and push on this, and it just doesn't budge. So I'm expecting it to perform right up to the same level as the other top rated cockpits out there when it comes to motor mounts. So let's talk about getting our seat mounted. I'll be using this Prisma seat. It's a NRG Prisma. I believe it's a 303B. It's shaped after that, but it has a special back that's got some glitter metal flake in it. You may have seen it in some other videos. Anyway, it's a good all-arounder seat, especially for sim racing. You don't need a, an FIA approved seat for sim racing duties, and this gets it done pretty well. I really don't have any complaints. Anybody sat in it is pretty much comfortable, so that really all that matters at the end of the day. All right, so we're going to be mounting to these rails that we have already installed over there on the cockpit base. And it's a very simple matter of putting some T-nuts in here, the M8s, and then mounting your seat to it. Now, depending on the seat that you're going to use, the mounting obviously is going to be different. You can have a seat out of a car if you want. And they usually have these flanges coming out on the bracket that the seat is actually already bolted to. And it lets you bolt in to, like you would bolt into like a profile. It's already got the T-nuts in it. Or they might have it curving back under and you have to get around, but you could still usually make that work. Also, a lot of people are going to be using sliders when they mount their seats. So you're going to have your seat brackets already on your seat, and then you put a sliders under there, mount your sliders to the bottom of these brackets, and then mount the sliders themselves to the actual rig, or these sliders, these little pieces here, your rails. And then you can move the seat back and forth. It depends on your own situation and what you want to do. I don't use sliders. I just don't like the way they feel when I'm pressing hard on the brake pedal. I can feel the lash in them. Even some of the expensive ones I got one time from Recaro, 
they still had some lash. It's just it's something, it's a personal preference thing. Not everybody's gonna feel the same. And sliders are probably gonna work fine for everyone else, except me. <laughs> but there's a problem when you do this. If you're just gonna mount this to these rails, on the brackets only, how are you gonna get the seat to move back and forth? You have to loosen the bolts in there. But if you do that, then you're, you're kind of moving stuff back and forth and you're gonna scratch up your nice profiles. And obviously that's the last thing you wanna do, especially as much as I change seats around. So I found a solution that works pretty good. And I use a stuff called UHMW. And this is what it looks like. It's just a roll of it. And it's a plastic acrylic that has some very, is impregnated with some very slick stuff. So it's very, very slick. And I put it on the bottom, let's see it here, of the seat rails. I think you can see them there in the little white bits here. And you can see I've got some holes where I put my bolts in each side of these in the, the kind of foggy looking white. And this stuff, once it's bolted on there and flat, will slide on this rail. Push this back. Will slide on your profile rails and not mar them up at all. It's very slick stuff. So it just slides across the top and you don't get any gashes or marks or anything by doing that. And it's very easy to slide it because of that. But you do have to get underneath here and still loosen the bolts. It takes a lot more time than it does to reach in between your legs and pulling the bar and you slide them back and forth. But once you cinch it back down, it's a very, very solid mount. And that's what I like. I don't want any movement when I'm putting my foot on the brake pedal. There's another piece to the equation to make it simpler to get to your bolts and loosen them and tighten them again. It only takes me, if that, 30 seconds. If somebody comes over and I need to push the seat back, which is usually the case, not many shorter people come over. So I, pushing the seat back, then it takes me less than 30 seconds to do that. With them in it, I can loosen this up, get them to take a little pressure off the seat a little bit by lifting up off the wheel and then slide it to where they want it and then it's tightening it back down. I use these flanged hex bolts. I don't use a socket head cap that has the hex wrench requirement because of the clearance on the back of the seat, just makes it a little difficult. Not a real issue in the front because the, the rake of the seat's like that, so there's a lot more room in the front, but on the back, it can be pretty tight in there. So you need to get these on there so you don't have a problem with clearance, and I use one of these. This is just a ratcheting box-in wrench, right? So all I have to do if somebody comes over is go under here and hit four bolt heads with this. And it's usually half a turn to a turn before it's loose enough and I can slide it back and forth, no problem. So then it's back in, bang, 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 tighten it back down, and we're done. And they have a nice stiff seat to sit in now, and it's not going to move on them when they're stomping on the brake pedal. So this is just the solution I came up with. People ask me about it, so I, I just like to show people these things when we come to like the seat mounting pieces in some of my videos. Just go over how I'm doing this in case you think you might want to do that. You can buy this stuff anywhere, Amazon, other stores. So obviously you guys know I don't do affiliate links, so yeah. I won't have a link to this, so you're just going to have to look it up. It's called UHMW, but a lot of people call it slick tape, so you might want to just look that up. Right, so that's about it. Oh, I just want to show you the difference on these seat brackets. This one is 6.3 millimeters long, or rather not long, but rather wide, and that's pretty thick, but it's aluminum, and these are Sparco aluminum brackets. Now, they're, they're rebranded JCL, racing to be faster, and got a nice red finish to them but they also come in aluminum. You don't need those. I typically tell people to get these. These are the metal type of seat brackets, side mounts. And this is a Sparco. You don't have to get Sparco. You can get the knockoffs that they have on eBay for like $30, $40. Because I think these run like 60 bucks, 70 bucks. But anyway, the important thing here is you want to make sure you've got plenty of slots in these brackets. You want to have plenty of room to be able to move that seat bolt once you have it in the seat. You want to be able to move it in a rotating degrees like this. Not back and forth, but like this, so you can get the rake exactly where you want it to be for your driving position that makes you comfortable, so you do long stints and you don't get a bad hurting back when you get out of your rig. There's a lot of adjustment in there. Typically you'll have in the front or the back, depending which one, you'll have a bolt up here in the hole. Let me show you the hole. And then in the back we'll use the slot because that's usually the spacing on a racing bucket as far as the bolt pattern goes. And on the bottom, which is the exact same down here, you have a lot of options for mounting here too. And this will make your life a lot easier having a side mount rather seat bracket like this one. And yeah, you can use the slots, you can use the holes, whatever you want, very flexible. Yeah, highly recommend. Now this is steel, it's only about three millimeters thick. And yeah, so, but it's steel, so you know, aluminum, they make them a little bit thicker. Either one will work, or like I said, you know, you might have a different situation where you wanna use something else. 
But in any case, if you have a bucket, you're gonna have to use that mount bracket anyway. And you can put your sliders under here and off you go. So that's about it. Now we're gonna go ahead and put our T-nuts into our profiles over there. I've already got it spaced out to 360 millimeters. So that should fit this bracket and the way the seat's sitting in the brackets perfectly. And we'll find out once I get over there. But yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and get this set up. When we come back, we'll take a look at it and see how it went. Here is the seat now firmly mounted to the All-in-One Gaming Pro Series cockpit. And it went just like I discussed in the last segment there. We have our hex head bolts mounted into some T-nuts in there. And you can see them there. Easy to get to in this configuration. And you can see the other ones up front, I believe. There's one up there somewhere. I'm <laughs> trying to go around the front and show you those. But you can see how close the bottom of the seat gets to the rail. So there could be a clearance issue if I was trying to get a regular hex wrench in here. Of course, the seat is mounted very firmly now. It's nothing like a directly bolted seat when you're doing sim racing. It's just when you're stomping on the brake pedals and stuff. And there's the other bolt. It's kind of dark in here, but you can see it over there. I've got another one sitting over here. Everything went pretty good. Not too much of a drama to get it all mounted. And I've already sat in it, and it looks pretty good as far as the angle I have against the wheelbase. Everything looks pretty straight. I did have to move this shifter, this pro shifter accessory. And you can see the bracket is sticking out just a little bit past this and getting up against the seat. And this is sometimes, if your seat's too wide, you can't do it like this as far as the brackets. You have to pull them back up if you watch the build video and put one here and put one here. And I also like to put another one under here where this one is. And that gives you the torque, anti-torque bit. So when we're pulling on the shifter handbrake, whatever it is you have mounted there, doesn't twist and bend and just feels mushy under your stresses that you're putting on it. But yeah, everything's good here. Seat is mounted. And it looks to be just about where I need it to be as far as once I get the steering wheel on here. Won't know for sure until I do that. But yeah, we're getting closer now. And really the only thing to do, the big thing to do is get our pedal tray assembly mounted back in here. You can see the T-nuts are in there. And then I'm going to move that back or forth depending on where I need it so that my feet can properly manipulate the pedals. So we'll get to the pedal tray next. So I have a set of pedals attached to the pedal tray. I reinstalled the pedal tray if you've been watching this video in sequence. I took it out so I'd have a good standing room when I was wrestling with the bolts to, on that Midge 20 motor over there to get it mounted to the front wheel mount. So yeah, I'm running the Simtrex pedals and they were able to bolt in nicely. There's plenty of room here, I think, for the profiles with the 4545 up front, the 4590 in the back to make and of course the slots, you can see I'm in the back slot now. I was in the front when I was, if you saw this pedal tray before in the build segment. So I put the front one in the middle slot and left the back ones in the back. So yeah, everything lined up well, 180 millimeter spacing here on these mounts for this pedal base that you can get with your Simtrex when you order them, if you choose to do so. I've already got everything lined up so that my legs reach it rather well. And it's very solid mount five bolts each side on these plates. So as you might imagine, it doesn't flex at all that I can tell now that I have everything cinched down tightly. I'll go ahead and go on this side and show you this. And the Simtrex have those hydraulic dampers, as you can see there, and the blue actually matches the blue frame. What are the chances of that? <laughs> so yeah, the pedals are ready to go. Again, had no difficulties with this pedal tray that I could speak of. Nothing really detrimental to say about it. It just bolts in and yeah, you bolt your pedals to it and it seems to be a very solid platform. But we'll find out once we're actually in and driving because I'll be doing some heel and toe and pounding on them pretty good. So we'll see how that pedal tray in this unit reacts to that when we get to that segment. So next, really the only thing left to do is get my shifter mounted. I'll be using a ProSim H pattern shifter. So I can do some heel and toe. And I have that lowered in the correct position. But when we come back, we'll talk about how to get the shifter mounted and how we're gonna use these 180 millimeter long profiles that come with the 
pro add-on or accessory that All-in-One Gaming offers for this regular side mount piece here. So when we come back, we'll be looking at that. As you can see, we've got a few different shifters out here because I just want to talk to you a little bit about how we're going to be mounting our shifter or the shifter that I'm going to be running this time, which is going to be this big monster over here, this ProSim H pattern. But I want to show you some of the options too as far as mounting shifters. Typically what we'll see is shifters with different flange plates. And usually they have a flange, sometimes they do not. This is what I'm talking about on the flange. And I call this the inline flange design. And we have one here and we have one over here. And those, you don't need any crossing profiles or anything special. You can just bolt these directly to the profile like that. Now there will be a restriction as far as how much lateral movement you get out of it. Obviously we don't have anything there. And of course you can fab up an aluminum plate or something and bolt it to the single one so it hangs off both sides and make your holes or do different things like that. There's other ways to get it done. But I've always found that it's easier, much easier, when you're mounting shifters, especially as many shifters that I mount in different reviews, to have the profile like this crossing. So well, let's just do it this way. Looks a little better. Like we have in the Pro Accessory that was shipped with this rig. So we've got the crossing pieces here and we have one here. Of course, this is exaggerated. These are 400 millimeters long and obviously the ones I'm using are only 180 millimeters long. But you can see where it's going to be advantageous to give us a lateral motion here with whatever we put up here. Not only that, but having two, we might just mount one in the front and one in the back. Now there's also some limitations to that too. And what I mean by that is let's take one of these, what I call a, a four bolt flange. And this is a handbrake. And we put that up here. And you can see there's not a lot of room behind here. So we can still get these close enough to do it though. Let me put this out front here so you can see a little better. There's only 55 millimeters on the centers of this Husingveld handbrake. A good handbrake, by the way. That will match in here like this. But you can see there's not a lot of space. If I was mounting my corner brackets in between these, which I do sometimes depending on the application. And obviously I couldn't do that. So this is an application where I'd be mounting my brackets like I have them over here on the Pro, just like this with brackets on the sides of each side of that crossing shifter mount that comes OEM or the default shifter mount or side mount as they call it on this Pro Series rig. So no problem there. And of course we've also got plenty of room to move this. Not only that, but you can, once you loosen these bolts up, you can get a little bit of angle on these because of the distance of the available in the flanges over here. So you can actually rotate a little bit so it's more ergonomic when you reach out and grab it because remember we're sitting in the seat and we all reach, we're always reaching out a little bit of an angle, be it right or left, depending on where your controls are mounted. And this helps give you a little bit more ergonomic position on it. And if you're doing long stints, it really helps in your durability of your shoulder and stuff like that that you're using for this. So I'm going to be using this guy here, like I said before. Oh, before I get to that, we also have what I call the box shifters. And they are, usually have some kind of a rectangular shaped box. Fanatec has one. This one is from uh, VMS, VNM. Yeah, the Vietnam shifter. It's a very good shifter. It's got its own mounting issues. We've got holes in the bottom. But if we took the holes in the bottom, obviously we can't do that, right? We would need spacing in between these. Let me get them over here a second. Yeah, I need enough space here. Pull these guys back a little. We could put these still mount our cross pieces and then on the sides, on these inside pieces here, other corner brackets with just holes in them. And then we could put this over those corner brackets and just run our bolts from underneath and secure it that way. So again, just different ways to do things. And by the way, this manufacturer does have, and a lot of them, most of them do, have some kind of adapter bracket that it, enables you or enables you to mount these to profile or something else and just drill holes through it. We're going to have obviously again the H pattern shifter here from ProSim mounted and this presents its own issues because it's so long. There's actually 270 millimeters between the centers on this mounting plate where the slots are. And those are the centers of the slot. So that's another consideration. Not only that, but it has this guy sticking out the back. <laughs> And this controller rod. Now this moves when we move the shifter. I'll move it forward and you can see it come out the back. Not much. I'd say that's about 10 millimeters. 
maybe 12. So that's something though that you can have to consider if there's anything behind where you're going to be mounting the shifter. And we'll talk more about that once we get it over there and get it mounted. So it's pretty easy what we're going to do here. When you get the Pro Kit, they give you some six millimeter spring ball T-nuts that go in these channels, of course, and some M6 bolts that will go into them. So you can mount whatever you want, however you want. So I'll be doing that. I'll be putting the spring balls in, and then I'm going to go over there. And it's just a very simple matter at that point of just running my M6 bolts in here. I use little washers and hex heads and get this securely attached. It's very stiff as far as when you're pulling straight back, but there is going to be some lateral flex in that mount, just like all the mounts. But remember, we're not pulling sideways on it. We're pulling at a little bit of an angle, like I said before, but not so much that it's really going to make a difference and make it move if we have it cinched down properly. At least I don't think. We're going to have to get over there and, and take a look at it while I'm actually using it and I'm driving, and then we'll see how it reacts to that. But right now what I'm going to do is go ahead and just get this over here, get it mounted to those 180 millimeter profiles like this. And then when we come back, we'll take a look at how that went. This is how the ProSim H pattern shifter is looking once we have it mounted. And again, your kit, on, if you order these Pro bars, these 180 millimeter long profiles, you get a T-nut set that goes in there. I did not get that, so I'm using a 40 series T-nut in here, which works fine, by the way, just so you know that. Again, I think I mentioned in the build that the 40 series, a lot of those parts work on this 45 series, no problem. So I got my M6 bolts installed, socket head cap units, and yes, yeah, very stiff. The way I have this mounted right now, I have high confidence this is going to feel pretty good when I'm using it. Now, again, as I mentioned in the previous segment, you can see this rod that extrudes from the back of the shifter. That's part of the rod that's inside. You have to have clearance for that, and you can see the clearance for that is pretty close. <laughs> and I did that on purpose. So now when I shift it, it won't hit. Go back here and do a shift towards the front. It won't hit the side. Let's see if I can get a top shot of that. There you go. So we got good clearance there. It's only a few mil, but that's all you need because this shifter is not going to be moving while I'm using it. So I don't have to worry about that bar getting into this 45 by 45 profile for the upright here. And you can see I'm pretty far back, but my seat's pretty far back too. That's just the position I decided to configure for the cockpit in general. The shifter knob is a little bit past the plane of the rim I'll be using here. And that's typically where I like it. Of course, that's totally subjective. Just because I like my shifter knob to be in that location doesn't mean that you will. As I always stress in my videos, we're all different. We've already got the keyboard mounted over there, and I'm going to stick the keyboard on. The only thing left to do is get my mouse plate mounted. I'm going to mount that in front of the shifter because it's going to allow me to reach down and have access to my trackball pretty easily, I think. So when we come back, I'm going to have that mounted. We'll have the trackball on here. And we'll go ahead and put the tray, or rather the keyboard, on the tray and see how all that's looking. I have the mouse tray attached to the side mount. And I have it in the top channel, which raises it up a little bit, so it's a little bit closer to the reach. when I'm sitting over here in the seat and reaching over on the other side of the shifter, or in front of the shifter, depending on how it feels at the time. So that went well. Just one T-nut in the channel, and yeah. M8 bolt and you're done. And it's pretty sturdy. And it, if you saw on the build, it has this ribbing. I don't know how this is going to show up. It's got a ribbing underneath there that stretches to the very edge down here, which does give it a firm feel. It's flexy, but yeah, it's just holding a mouse, so it doesn't have to be but so stiff, obviously. And we've got the keyboard mounted to the keyboard tray. Not really mounted, it's just sitting there. And this is a great tray, by the way. It really is. You can just do that and it keeps going. Now that might be an issue for someone who has motion on their rig because if your keyboard's still out here and it's out of the way and you're driving, it can be flopping around and then kind of ease into you like that, which happens to me on my rig over there <laughs> with a different type of keyboard tray mount, but it's stiffer than this is. I just use my elbow to bump it away from me <laughs> when it gets too close. Now, when I attach a keyboard, I used to use Velcro. But I've changed that to some, and I'm going to show you this. I don't have anything on this tray. You can see there's nothing there. 
and there's nothing on the back of my keyboard tray here. But you don't have to have anything. I'm going to walk over here and show you this tray. Bring that out. I use these little sticky things. Those are the old Velcro strip that I used to use. But I use these Velcro, not Velcro, but these silicone sticky pads. These are initially made for, you can see how stretchy they are. And then they stretch, you know, they rebound back. But they're very sticky on the surface. So they're meant to hold your cell phone or something like that on your car dash or your truck dash or something. So I put one on each side and then you can just take your keyboard and lay it on top of those two things. And we'll do that like this. And that really holds it. It doesn't go anywhere. See, I'm pushing on it and it's not going anywhere. So I really like those and it's easy to take it back off if I need to do something or, you know, take the keyboard and use it somewhere else. So very handy to have those pads on the one. If I was going to use that keyboard tray over here on this All-in-One Gaming Pro Series, then I would certainly use those pads. And they're easy to get. eBay, Amazon, everywhere. Just cell phone sticky pad, I guess. You can look that up. Easy enough to get these things. But I like the way this has come together overall. I think everything is, is functional. It's well thought out. And this is a very easy using key, keyboard tray mount and of course it goes under there it still clears over the top of my legs and it will clear the steering wheel of course that'll be different if I had a bigger steering wheel on I'd have to lower it a little bit but it's still clearing my knee so I could use it in that position so yeah we've got everything mounted now pedals wheel everything so we're ready to bring the monitors over here I'm going to drop them down so they'll be nice and close to the wheelbase over here and yeah we're going to get in and do some driving and try to put some pressure on this cockpit and the mount points that they have and see how it responds. We're in iRacing, we're at Sebring and the Lotus 79. And we're doing some heel and toe shifting in this Lotus. Now this Lotus doesn't require you to use the clutch as much as you see me using it here, but this is how I train and practice. So yeah, the car I run, you need to use the clutch every time you shift. So it's good practice. And that's what simulators are for, really, at the end of the day, getting some practice time in so you can get your muscle memory down and do better when you're actually driving a car. Now, first we'll look at the pedal tray on this downshift part here. If you're like me, I'm not seeing any movement at all in this pedal tray. As stiff as can be underfoot, I'm getting great tactile feedback from the pedals. They're not moving around at all, which can dampen the experience on what I'm feeling when I'm using the pedals, which can also take longer to get muscle memory on what the car is doing when you manipulate the pedals in a certain way. So this is great. And of course, I'm not too surprised here. I mean, we are using no less than five M8 bolts on each one of these side plates that the profiles are mounted between. And they're mounted to those massive 90 by 90 profiles. So yeah, I'm not too surprised about this. I kind of thought it would be like this anyway, once I was mounting it. You can feel these things out when you've done a, this as much as I have. So yeah, no complaints in the pedal tray. I think anybody who's watching this would agree. It's pretty solid. And I'm hammering it pretty good here. Now the shifter mount itself, you watch me doing the shifts. It's not moving at all. It, it, I can tell. I don't know if you guys can see the video better than me, but yeah, I'm hammering pretty good on it when I'm going through the gears here, especially on the downshifts. And yeah, it's just not, not moving. And what the funny thing is, we're putting a sideways torque on this and it's not moving sideways at all either because I'm reaching out to my right to do this. So I'm actually putting some sideways torque back towards me. So it should be twisting to the left a little bit. And some of these mounts do, but this one doesn't. It's very solid as you can see, it's not moving at all. And you can tell how much force I'm putting in the shifter because on some of these shifts, you can actually watch the keyboard. That's what I used as my gauge to see the forces that are being transmitted through this cockpit's frame. You can see the keyboard's actually moving because it's more sensitive. It's out there way past where the mount point is. I and mean, it's like a big lever. And so you can see it moving around when I'm hitting the bumps. And when the wheel, because I have the wheel turned up, you can see that where I'm receiving the force feedback through the wheel, that yeah, it's moving also. Now, let's talk about that wheel mount, that front wheel mount there. That is not moving at all as far as I can tell. And again, when I'm going through the very rough spots, you can see that keyboard jumping around, but you don't see any movement in that front mount plate or the uprights that are holding it. And this is what you want with direct drive because you want as much fine detail coming through that connection you have to the motor as possible. That way you maximize 
what you paid for when you bought this direct drive motor to get those details. And when you have a solid mount like this, it is very, very good. They've done a good job with the mount here. I really can't complain, as you can see, when I'm going through some of these places in the corner up here on 17 is a good one. In fact, the following corner is a good one too, where I've got this thing turned up to 20 Newton meters. That's the max it can do. So it's only 20 Newton meters. And I have the setting in iRacing turned up pretty high too, as you can see, my arms are really working it there. I would not do a, a hour long race with at this power level, but I'm pushing things. So I want to see how it responds. And you can see going through there, you know, my hands are really, I'm having to work to can keep control of the car and control of the steering wheel. And yeah, it's the keyboard's jumping around, but there is no motion in that motor mount. And again, this is what you want. And this is what you expect when you pay for a premium cockpit. I wouldn't expect anything less. And if there was less, then I would have something to say about it as far as flex goes. So overall, I really don't have anything to complain about here. As you can see, I'm looking, I'm testing as hard as I can on it, I'm banging on it and it's responding quite well. So I really don't have anything to complain about here. It just gets the job done and does it quite well. I'm feeling all the feedback coming through the wheel. So yeah, don't think you could be happier with a cockpit like this. And the blue color is kind of nice too. But then again, a blue color is something that you're going to have to, if you want the same color, you're going to have to order the profiles directly from the manufacturer. So that's something to consider also, if you want to add something on later, they will do it for you, but you're going to have to order something from them instead of going around somewhere else and finding like it was a black profile or a silver one. But that's with any colored profile, not just the blue. So yeah, nothing to complain about here. This is, as you guys can see, it's doing the job quite well. And again, at this price point, it should be doing what you see here. And this is what it's all about at the end of the day. So yeah, when you get to this level of spending money, you really get a good experience as far as the dollar spent, I think. And yeah, so... <laughs> Not much else to say here. You guys can see it for yourself. So yeah, we'll just go ahead and get on to the final thoughts.
Final thoughts on the Pro Series cockpit from the guys at All-in-One Gaming. This is the second video in a two-part review series on their Pro Series cockpit, called The Setup. See the first video, called The Build, for a detailed look at this cockpit's parts and build process. The first component to be mounted was the direct drive motor I would be using for real-world testing. It was a midge 20 newton meter servo. The front mount included in my kit allowed me to easily mount this servo with its 102 millimeter hole spacing. It will also accommodate SimuCube and Cole Morgan servos. Once mounted with the bolts properly torqued, it did not move when I applied some pressure to it. Of course, the only true test as to a cockpit's motor mount stiffness is to test it with the motor mount set to its highest torque limit. I ran the midge at 100% torque and dialed the iRacing setting to a very high level. I would not want to run an hour-long race at these levels, but thought it appropriate for putting enough stress on the motor mount to show any flex. After some hard laps at Sebring, I could neither feel or see any flex in the motor mount assembly. Allowing all the force feedback details that the 20 newton meter midge is capable of delivering to be felt. This is what a premium price cockpit should do. Next, my attention moved to the pedal tray assembly. Here again, while putting a good amount of pressure on it during my heel and toe shifting practice, I felt nor could see any flex in that assembly. Not a big surprise considering the design of the pedal tray, with no less than 5 M8 bolts securing the mount to the 90 by 90 chassis rails. Now on to the shifter mount assembly. I used my Pro Upgrade on my cockpit to secure the very large ProSim H pattern shifter. I did have to pay attention to the center gear rod protruding from the shifter housing, but I had a little trouble getting it to line up the way I wanted it to. This is a heavy duty shifter that you can slam around without worrying about it breaking. If a shifter mount is going to show any flex, it would be during this type of use, I would think. The trend of no flex detected continued in this mount. I did make a point of using some heavy handed shifting to try and get it to move. I did not feel or see any movement. Lastly, I mounted the seat using the usual process of bolting my seat rails directly to the cockpit seat rail profiles. Nothing special here, and once all the bolts were properly tightened, the results were no flexing in the seat when pushing hard on the brake pedal. To me, it is obvious that a lot of thought went into the design of the Pro Series cockpit. The chrome blue color sets this cockpit apart from other top tier profile cockpits available today. And I think it stands with the best kits out there currently just a very solid platform to build your custom sim solution on. I'm Barry Rowland. Thanks again for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you would like to help support what I do here at the SRG, visit my website at simracinggarage.com.